You are listening to a sermon from River Community Church in Prairieville, Louisiana. Well, this morning I want you to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John chapter 1. And you might be saying to yourself, why, God, why John chapter 1? In most office during the Christmas season, we focus in on the stories of Matthew and Luke, and we refer to Isaiah and some of the other uh, stories of the Bible which talk about the coming of Jesus Christ, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, coming to the world as a baby. However, we don't often spend this time of the year in John's Gospel. Most people around the world recognize or celebrate Christmas in some way, shape, or form, but increasingly people, including us here in the Church of Jesus Christ, we lose sight of who Jesus is, really is, why he came and what his mission is. We sing the hymns, we sing the carols. In fact, a side note here, yesterday, for instance, we were downtown, we were at the Baton Rouge Symphony, uh, the Christmas concert, and and this, we were down there because of some friends of ours who were in the chorus. And we're singing the Hallelujah Chorus, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And what's going through my mind is 2,500 plus people, and we sing that, and do we really have any idea of who Jesus really is? And I'm not talking in general about the secularization of Christmas or the commercialization of Christmas. That's been happening for many, many decades, and it's going to continue to happen no matter what. But what about us here this morning? What about us here in the church where the, the, the subtle but increasing erosion of the person and the work of Jesus Christ happens, and too often we don't even know it's happening? And that's what is going on here with the Apostle John. That's what he was seeing in the last part of the first century to the churches that had been established for many decades. John's now growing old. You know, he he had daily walked with Jesus. He helped build the church. He knew the apostles. He was familiar by this time with the writings of Matthew and Mark and Luke and Peter and Paul and James. He was a close, close to Jesus Christ. He was a close friend of Peter's. Probably the other apostles like Paul too. He's now in Ephesus, that great church that Paul had established. He's helping the elders, he's discipling others, he sees the need, though, to write another gospel. A gospel that lays it right on the line about who Jesus is, this baby that came, that the churches were established. As he says in chapter 20, verse 31, a familiar verse to many of us, he says, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. And when people ask where to start reading the Bible, the most common answer given is the Gospel of John. And so John starts at the beginning. He starts at the very beginning, not with the birth of Jesus Christ, But with the beginning, follow along. If you have your Bibles open in John 1 or follow on the screen as I read the first 18 verses of this gospel. John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. 
and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own. He came to his own people, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, and he that is Christ has made him known. This is the very word of God himself. Thanks be to God. We sing. We sing, for, us to, for unto us a child is born, the Savior, Christ the Lord, Emmanuel, God with us. Well, who really is this child? During the ministry of Jesus, many people, and not just those opposed to him like the Pharisees, wondered who was Jesus? Who is this baby that's grown into this man, this son of a carpenter? The Pharisees asked in Luke 5, 21, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But then among the apostles themselves, in John 20, we have the apostle Thomas. Remember Thomas? He said, I, I don't believe Jesus is alive. I don't believe he resurrected from the dead I, unless I touch him. And so Jesus comes and Thomas touches him and Jesus says to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are all those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's each of us today. Many, if not most people, believe that Jesus actually, actually existed, that you know, he was a flesh man. People believe that he was a great teacher, a prophet, that he just loves all people. They believe that he taught great moral truths, that he changed the world, and he did change the world. The, our calendar has changed because of him. People believe that he helps, get us, he helps you get in touch with yourself, that he fixes our problems, our marriages, or gives us a dream, our dream job, or other dreams that we have. And because of all those kinds of things, the thoughts that go through our mind, the, 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 the visions that we have of who Jesus is, we need to go back. We need to take a step back. And we need to be reminded over and over again, as Paul and Peter and other writers of the New Testament say, that we need to be constantly reminded of who Jesus is, of who the biblical Jesus is, of what the Bible actually says about him, what his purpose was, what his mission really was, and what it continues to be. You see, the most important question you will ever answer and you'll ever wrestle with in your life is who is Jesus and why did Jesus come? The incarnation of Jesus Christ is more than just a nice story. It's more than just going out and seeing a manger scene or 
or some other kind of thing, singing Christmas carols, things that make us feel better. But the question is about God's truth. You see, most of the world rejects, rejects even wrestling with the question of who Jesus Christ is, of the truth of Jesus Christ. And, but yet our trust and our faith in that truth determines our ultimate destiny. Your destiny, my destiny, is by determined by what we believe about Jesus Christ, about what Jesus Christ said, about why the incarnation happened in the first place. You see, Jesus will either say to you, as he does in Matthew 25, 34, come, you who are blessed by the Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Praise God. Or Jesus will say to you, as he does in Matthew 7, verse 23, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. So who is Jesus? Who was born, came in the flesh, forgiving sin. John doesn't waste any time here in John 1. He doesn't waste any time developing some lengthy argument or a sophisticated theme. He just starts right off, very bluntly, with the most profound truth of all time in verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So first, John says, in the beginning was the Word. What's John talking about here? The beginning of what? The beginning of Jesus' birth? No, John is going right back to the start of it all in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God. In the beginning was the Word, in the beginning, God. John points back to Genesis in the Old Testament, con connecting God and the beginning before time and space. There was God, Jesus. Just as we've been studying Genesis these past few months, trying to show the unity, the unity of the Scriptures from beginning to end. John's saying it's all one gospel. It's all the good news of Jesus Christ from beginning to end. One word of God. If you're talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, you have to begin at the beginning, at the real beginning. Who we are before God and why the need for a Savior in the first place. You can't really understand the full extent of Matthew and Luke or even Mark or Acts without the context of what John is saying in his gospel. John completes the story that was already being challenged before John died. Who is this Jesus? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, he was in the beginning with God, nothing before existed, there is only one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who all work together, who work together before time, planning, or using the theological term, foreordaining all that's to come to pass, the covenant of works, the covenant of grace, where Jesus comes as a baby in the flesh, living a perfect life, dying for our sin, as we'll be talking more about over the next few weeks. There is no Old Testament God and New Testament God. There's a further revealing of God in the New Testament, but there's only one God from beginning to the end when Jesus comes again. One God. Adam and Eve were tempted. They desired to be like God. They sinned and brought sin into the world. But we didn't mess up the plan of God. We didn't mess it up at all. How can you and I mess up 
the plan of God. God knew exactly what, he, what they would do. And God knew exactly what he would do. You see, God knew exactly what he would do in his great love, showing grace and mercy for those created in his image. John says in Revelation 1, I am the Alpha, the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. I am the first and I'm the last. John writes those words when he's exiled from Ephesus later on to Patmos and receives from the Holy Spirit the final revelation of God, of the hope and the assurance that we have in Jesus Christ. So, in the beginning was the Word. The Word, which is literally in the Greek, Logos. Who is the Word? Who is the Logos? Verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John tells us right out who he is. The Word is Jesus Christ, who existed in the beginning before he became flesh. He was with God, and he was was God. This is the very divinity of Jesus Christ himself. 1 John 1, verse 1. John says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked on with our hand, upon, and we've touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The word of life. Now think back for a moment. How did creation come into being? Nine times in Genesis 1, Moses says, and God said, God spoke. It's the very word of God that brings creation into being, as John says in verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. It is the voice of God. It's the voice of God itself that does creation who comes in the flesh. John Calvin has an interesting translation of this when he says, the speech of God. In the beginning was the speech, and the speech was with God, and the speech was God. All things were made through him. Psalm 33, 6, by the word of the Lord the heavens were made. The word of God spoke all things into being by the will of his Father. Creation itself testifies to the existence of God. And that's enough to condemn all men, as Paul says in Romans 1. Jesus, who is the word incarnate in the flesh, is how we can personally know God. You and I. He's not some abstract being out there. We can personally know God himself, and that's what we're looking at here. God speaks directly through his word in the scriptures, which is why we declare the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments the very word of God, the actual words of God. The authority of the Holy Scriptures, as the Westminster Confession says, the authority of the Holy Scripture, because of which it ought to be believed and obeyed, does not depend upon the testimony of any man or any church, but entirely upon God, its author, because it is the Word of God. The most wonderful truth of all is that while God speaks indirectly through creation. Through the prophets of the Old Testament, God now speaks directly to you and to me through Jesus Christ. Directly to me through Jesus Christ. Now the Jews who would be reading these words know that the Word of God is more than just words, but means something that is actually done or accomplished. Think back to Genesis 1, and God said, let there be light, and it, did something happen? 
there was light. Right? God spoke, and it happened. Nothing you or I can do, right? The word Jesus Christ speaks, and it happens. Psalm 55, verse 11. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. The word of God, when it says it happens. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, through whom he made the universe. So the Jews understand what the word of God is. He speaks it and it happens. Now, John's use of the Greek logos had a very powerful meaning for the Greek-influenced people of the first century, whether Gentiles or Hellenistic Jews. You see, John, when he wrote this, toward the end of the first century, he's very, very intentional in using this Greek word logos. One of the early Greek philosophers said that the logos or word was the divine reason that controlled the universe. It's, life isn't random or in chaos, but there's no way that we can ever know who this God is. He can't be known. We'll never know who he is. He's just there. And that kind of thought was carried on through the other Greek philosophers, whether it's Plato or Socrates. And we see in Paul, in Acts chapter 17, remember he went to, Ac- went to Athens? And he's there in the Areopagus where men would gather around and they'd start talking about this thing. And what does Paul do? He says, your unknown God in that statue over there, that unknown God that you revere has a name. And that name is Jesus Christ. He can be known. James Montgomery Boyce kind of puts a twist on this and has John saying, listen, you Greeks, the very thing that has most occupied your philosophical thought and about which you have all been writing for centuries, the logos of God, this word, this controlling power of the universe and of man's mind, this has come to earth as a man. And you Greeks, we have seen him. We have seen him. He can be known. Now let's go to the second phrase in verse 1. And the word was with God. God. Jesus Christ, John's saying Jesus Christ isn't some isolated person out there somewhere alone. No, he is with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. What we call the Trinity, three in one. Again, this all goes back to the beginning in Genesis chapter 1, where we have the first glimpse of this, of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the creation where Moses deliberately uses the plural form for God, together hinting that God isn't just alone and by himself and that Jesus isn't just alone and by himself. In Genesis 1.26, we have these great words, let us make man in our image, and we talked a lot about that a few months ago. Let us make man in our image, us, God the Father, and God the Son, making you and me in his image and in his likeness. Again, James Montgomery Boyce says, when John speaks of the Word, he means God the Son, Jesus Christ, who eternally lives in relationship with and does the will of God the Father. John uses the words with God to be sure, to be absolutely sure that we understand that Jesus is not, as I said, somehow by himself, or that he's somehow created separate from God and he's just kind of, you know, wandering around out there doing God's will, but he's not God himself. 
But John says that he's bound together with the Father and the Holy Spirit as one God in three distinct persons. Three distinct persons. And then the third, the last phrase of verse 1. And the Word was God. And the Word was God. Now, can John get any more direct with us? Is there any other way to say it? John says, and the Word was God. It doesn't matter what others say. John's saying to the, 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 the creep of questioning who Jesus is in the church, he's saying to all who are going to read this letter, quit doubting. Quit letting the, the, the false teachers tell you that Jesus is not really God, that really is not the Savior. He's just some prophet, maybe a teacher. Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And they gave various answers. Elijah, John the Baptist maybe, Jeremiah. But then he said to the disciples, to the apostles, who do you say that I am? And Peter gives this great words in Matthew 16 that we talk about a lot. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. For you, every one of you this morning, for me, for us gathered together in this church calling ourselves a fellowship of believers, who do you say that Jesus is? Look down in your heart, your soul, your mind, because that's, that's what John's writing this about. He's watching the doubts creep in here toward the end of the first century, and he's telling us then, he's telling the people then, and he's telling us now that Jesus is God himself. John's already said that the word was in the beginning and with God, and now the declaration, he is God. John chapter 14, verses 9 and 10, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. Makes sense, right? So Jesus says to him, Philip, have I been with you so long you still don't know me? And Philip's probably scratching his head. Of course I know you, Lord. But then he says to Philip, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Philip, show us the Father when you've been with me all this time? Jesus says to Philip, I'm God, fully God. More literally, this phrase in John, could it be translated, and God was the Word, rather than the Word was God. God was the Word. In, John, in verse 18, John says that Jesus is the only God, the only God who's at the Father's side, who, has made, who He has made Him known. The only God, counter to horrible paganism, hundreds of different gods existed between the Greek and the Roman empires and their, and their little gods. And here John says that Jesus is the only God. It is Jesus who makes his Father known to us. It's Jesus who makes himself who is God known to you and to me day to day right now as we have all the stuff going on about Christmas where we lose track of who Jesus really is John says in John 10 verse 3 I and the Father are one he says a couple chapters before in 858 before Abraham was I am. And when Jesus says, I am, he's referring directly back to the personal name of God that was given by God to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. And if there's ever a Hebrew word that we all should have on the tip of our tongues, it's this one, Yahweh, the most holy name 
and all of Scripture. You put a few vows to it and, and you come up with Jehovah. Yahweh, God himself. Jesus is saying, I am. I simply, I am. This is Jesus himself. Jesus himself saying that he is God. And that declaration both there and in the other one, I and the Father are one in other places, is why the Pharisees put Jesus to death. At least that was the reason they gave. To them, Jesus was a heretic. He was blaspheming God. He was claiming to be God himself to forgive sins, and we can't have that because you're not the Messiah. You're just a little, you know, just a guy that was born. We've got to get rid of you. Part of the problem was that even within the Pharisees, there were some who were beginning to believe. Okay? But we know that he was declaring the truth, that Jesus came to be our Savior, Christ the Lord, the newborn King, as we say and as we sing. See, John sees the growing heresies challenging the divinity of Jesus Christ, and he writes the truth of who Jesus is. And one of the most challenging heresies, both in the first four centuries and still now, and in the first four centuries, came from a man named Arius, who later in the third and fourth centuries, who said that Jesus was just a creation being. He was a God-like creature, who was subordinate to the Father and was not eternally existent. He, he, God just made him. However, the beginnings of this heresy were already starting at the time of John. What better way, what better way to undermine, undermine Christianity than to undermine who Jesus really is? There's nothing my friends, and this has been going on, if, as we've been studying Genesis, this has been going on since the beginning. We just finished, Trey just finished with Genesis, part of Genesis 3. Satan says, you know, did God really say this? You won't die. You'll be like, what? You'll be like God from the beginning, undermining the Creator undermining the Word, Jesus, doing the will of his Father and creating all, you and me. And Jesus and, and Satan's still doing it today. Jehovah's Witnesses, for instance, rewrite John 1 and other parts of John and other parts of the New Testament, denying that Jesus is God. Mormonism denies that Jesus is God, says he's a created being. And there's millions, in more, of more, more, millions of Mormons, and they have one of the best evangelistic outreaches of any group in the world. Islam says that Jesus is a great prophet of God but not God himself. Allah can only be a single person, a single God, which is one of the great starting points for Muslim evangelism if you get to talking to a Muslim. But Islam denies that Jesus is God. Most other religions see Jesus as a teacher, prophet, a good moral man, if they even mention him at all. Hinduism, Jesus is just one of the many, many ways of getting up the mountain. Buddhism, the same way. That's why John Calvin says that the knowledge of God is the first doctrine. Knowledge of God, knowledge of man, but you can't know yourself, you can't know man until you know who God is, who Jesus is, and why we celebrate, and why we take all this time for centuries in Advent. If we aren't clear on the deity of Jesus Christ, our theology stands on shaky ground along with the faith itself. 
and it gets undermined and we lose faith. John saw it coming, as I've mentioned, and he wrote a very clear and very definitive defense of the deity of Christ, proving who Jesus is. There's not a whole lot to misunderstand in what John's writing here. It's whether we want to believe it or not. Did this stop the attacks? No. They kept coming and coming. The whole Arian heresy. The councils thought they were putting it to rest with the Nicene Creed, which we've said occasionally here, which affirms step by step who Jesus is. Well, that may have put it to rest for five minutes, but at least it gave us a definitive, one of the most definitive documents ever written outside of Scripture. The challenges still come. Even our distortions here at Christmas can start down a road of watering down the gospel or believing things about Jesus that, that simply aren't true. I'm not just talking about the world around us. We can talk all we want about the world around us, but what about us as the Church of Jesus Christ? Again, why is John so firm? He starts here in John 1 and then spends the next 20 chapters talking about who Jesus is. All the I am sayings of Jesus are contained in John, step by step by step. This is Jesus Christ, who was born of the Virgin Mary, and so on. Because everything in Christianity depends on who Jesus is. Who Jesus is. And that's why Satan pushes so hard to undermine it. Undermine in ourselves who Jesus is. Is he, you know, does he just come alongside us as a, as a friend? And I could, we could go down through all, we could go, I could go around and so we could survey everybody here in all the different ways. Except who Jesus really is. Believing in the deity of Jesus Christ is a test of the veracity or truth of our faith for each and every one of us. Our daily walk as Christians. John warns, Jesus warns in John 8, 24, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. But then, but then he says, down, oh, about 10 verses or so, seven or eight verses or so in John 8, he says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Do you believe this, my friends? Are you truly a disciple of Jesus Christ, of God incarnate, who came in the flesh, which we'll get to? In John 1 here, does the Word, does the Word, Jesus Christ, abide or rest in you right now? That word abide, English doesn't come close to giving what that word truly means. Does Christ abide, rest, live? in you right now. If not, let's talk. Talk to Pastor Trey. Talk to one of our elders or someone who is mature in their faith and you can trust. Nothing in life is more important than your understanding, than a right understanding of who Jesus Christ 
is. Thank you for listening to this sermon from River Community Church in Prairieville, Louisiana, where you will always find biblical preaching, meaningful worship, and the equipping of disciples. For more information on River Community Church and its ministries, please visit rivercommunity.org.